the proposal said at least in the finance bill i mean may not be soothing i mean to those who practice on the direct taxes side now taking forward i mean that facelessness of the institutions and the process and procedures now the central government by virtue of the proposed amendment seeks to arrogate that power to notify a scheme i mean for the faceless income tax appellate tribunal i mean i'll make i mean a, a little bit more detailed descriptions and my comments uh, but then i i would say that the assessment has gone faceless appeal has gone faceless penalties have gone faceless many more processes proceedings are about to become faceless i mean where would this facelessness take us and uh, this facelessness should not i mean be taken to the tent where we all i mean find some cover for our face saving that much i can say now there are hosts of proposals in this finance bill and few of the proposals are the disposals of couple of institutions i have said right from the day when i heard the honorable finance minister and thereafter when i read the fine print of this budget then i said that this finance bill now seeks to write obituary for at least two institutions the income tax settlement commission and the authority for advance ruling and uh, but then every bill i mean which is presented before the parliament by and large contains some statement of object clause and that statement of object now can be deciphered from the memorandum so the memorandum like any other years memorandum reiterates that these amendments which are proposed in the income tax act now they inter alia are aimed to continue the reforms in the direct tax system fair enough and this continuation of the reforms in the direct tax system now is sought to be achieved as the memorandum says by doling out certain tax incentives but then if we read the tax incentives then many of us would believe that the many of the so called tax incentives i mean may not really be of i mean tax incentives which which may be which may be mattering or which may matter i mean to the uh, large sections of the citizenry of this country then the second objective as to how that reform the direct tax system is proposed to be achieved by these proposed amendment is by removing the difficulties faced by the taxpayers but then some of the so called removal of the difficulties as are proposed in this finance finance bill i even tend to increase the hardships and the difficulties for the taxpayer so we will see them as we proceed and the third is about the rationalization certain provisions i always say when you say that you want to rationalize certain provisions i mean there is an implicit acceptance that all that we had all along been reading i mean were not that rational and if i if i am permitted to say on the lighter note and some of them were even irrational and so now we will see as we proceed so the first provision now which uh, or or that or, or that amendment proposed amendment which is going to impact i mean all we practicing chartered accountant is about uh, the increase in the threshold limit in certain situations uh of the threshold limit i mean for a person to get his books of accounts audited now as all of us know that under section 44 ab if a person carrying on any business now having turnover gross receipts or sales exceeding rupees 1 crore now is required to get his books of accounts audited now finance act 2020 now we are in the finance bill 2021 so not very long ago finance act 2020 i mean enhanced this limit of rupees 1 crore to 5 crores in certain situations and those certain situations were when the aggregate amount of receipts in cash i mean do not exceed 5% of the total receipts and aggregate payments in cash do not exceed 5% of the total payment and immediately after such enhancement by the finance act 2020 now a proposal now uh, which is there in this finance bill is to increase that limit from 5 crores to 10 crores and the rationale which has been given 
and I tell you, I mean, since I know that I am speaking before the chartered accountants, several budget meetings have taken place, and therefore, I mean, I, I mean, I am entitled to assume that uh, all of my professional friends are well versed with the budget proposals or the finance bill proposed amendments. Therefore, I may not be speaking in that sense about the proposals, but then the technicalities which are involved. I mean, something. What was the rationale and rationale, I mean, is justified to what extent? So I would be picking up, of course, certain micro aspect, but then with some mic, but with some macro background and the macro follow up. So the rationale and justification for this proposed amendment, now, which has been given in the memorandum while increasing the threshold limit from 5 crores to 10 crores, is that in order to boost the digital economy by giving incentives to the transactions through the banking channel and to reduce the compliance cost for the small and MSME, small and MSME firms. This limit now is proposed to be enhanced to rupees 10 crore. Now, while I mean, we all are with Honorable Finance Minister or for that matter with the government for their concern to promote the digital economy. And we are also conscious about the sensitivity. I mean, which this government I mean, claims to harbor that uh, there should be least cost in compliance for the small and MSME entities. But at the same time, I mean, one must ensure that such kind of the proposed amendment should not come as a counter, I mean, to the action of the government. Now, when we say that we want to promote digital economy, that's very good. But then the tax audits are done by the tax auditors not only in respect of those SSEs who have got the cash transactions but then there are many reporting requirements which are applicable even in case of those SSEs whose entire business is based on the digital transactions. So whether this memorandum seeks to say which in my respectful opinion if it seeks to say so I mean, cannot be said to be based on a sound reasoning that such a digitally promoted SSEs, I mean, can go without getting their books of accounts audited as if I mean, the tax audit does not, I mean, serve any purpose for the government. Because many of the clauses in form number 3CD, which the tax auditors are required to report, and such clauses when are reported by the tax auditors, in respect of all SSEs across the board, including these SSEs whose transactions, let us take it, are 100% the digital transactions, like now whether the depreciation which is allowable now is not required to be computed in case of such kind of an SSE. Now, is it not required I mean, for the tax auditors to report the transactions which are covered under section 43CA and section 50C for such kind of SSEs whose entire transactions are through the banking channel? Is the tax auditor not required to report? And if the tax auditor re reports, I mean, such kind of clauses in case of even such kind of SSEs about the non compliance of Section 43B and thus giving this kind of information to the assessing officer or for that matter, the CPC to make adjustments even at the processing level when a statutory due having not been paid is yet to be is, is, is sought to be claimed by such kind of SSEs. I mean, so there are whole hosts of provision in form number 3CD, which a tax auditor is required to report, even in case of those persons, those SSEs, those entities whose entire transactions are through the banking channel. And then to say that we want to promote digital economy as if you want to convey that the tax audit is useful only in that situation where the transactions are, where the transactions are carried on by the person uh, in a mode otherwise than through the banking channel no so the tax auditors i mean present so many things on the golden platter for the purpose of the consumption of the tax department which are taken assistance of not only by cpc but by the assessing officers so on the one hand i mean you are making everything faceless now your maybe i mean your scrutiny now has become uh, more an information driven scrutiny but then the service which a tax auditor renders 
after breaking his head into the books of account and the vouchers maintained by a, maintained by a tax payer now cannot be undermined and therefore last year we made it 5 crores now all of a sudden i mean what kind of inputs have what kind of inputs have gone i mean in this proposed decision making or in this decision making for bringing this proposed amendment in section 44 ab now on the and, and kindly see it is a case of a self goal now how is that now there is one proposed amendment in section 143 where which is being done by this finance bill now which seeks to say that the adjustment can be made by cpc or by the assessing officer at the time of the processing of return based on the income reported by the tax auditors i mean so far the expenditures reported by the tax auditors in form number 3 cd now could lead to the making of adjustment under section 143 now on the other hand on the one hand i mean you by bringing this proposed amendment to section 143 1 now seek to underline the importance of the tax audited tax auditors but on the other hand now i mean you are making such kind of proposed amendment i mean which inflicts the self injury on yourself so i don't think i mean this is a, this is a uh, a very sound proposal i mean uh, sound proposal of course of course certainly not from the professionals and professionals standpoint of view but even from the income tax department's point of view because i have seen the chartered accountants acting as the tax auditors doing the tax audit now happen to bring i mean such valuable input and information and uh, based upon that the prep, based upon that the adjustments are made the tax collections are made by the tax department and therefore i mean this kind of proposed amendment uh, made in this finance bill in section 44 ab by enhancing the limit from 5 crores to 10 crores in my respectful submissions and view i mean cannot be and should not be accepted the second proposed amendment now regarding 234c as all of us know the section 234c i mean seeks to impose interest in case somebody defers uh, the payment of advance tax installments and there are dates 15th of june 15th september 15th december and in section 234c and now there are four kinds of income now uh, regarding which uh, some exception has been created and under that ostensible belief and rightly so that since these incomes i mean cannot be predicted cannot be estimated and therefore the advance tax liability cannot be estimated in relation to such category of income and therefore there will not be any interest on the deferment of the tax in relation to these four kinds of income provided when these incomes result to the ssc the ssc pays the advance tax immediately in the installment which is falling immediately after the earning of such income and this memorandum says that the items which are so mentioned in that proviso or which are the exception in section 234c now list out such incomes which by its very intrinsic nature i mean cannot be predicted like if somebody if suppose if somebody has started a business in the month of january then obviously i mean the profit of the business could not be estimated on i mean the dates of advance tax installment which have already gone by and therefore i mean this has been considered as one of the exception in section 234c that if you start your business say in the month of january then you compute and estimate the advance tax or you compute your taxation liability for these three months january february march and then pay i mean whatever tax is there or whatever tax is estimated on the installment which falls after january say 15th of march similarly there there was a dividend which was covered under section 115 bbda or for that matter the capital gain suppose if capital gain i mean results in the month of january or february of the previous year obviously i mean nobody could have anticipated that he would sell his capital asset in the month of january or february i mean so the sum and substance of uh, of of my this discussion is that the four items of income which are there under section 234c i mean were the income of this nature which could not be predicted and therefore the liability the advance tax could not be estimated and therefore section 234c provided an exception that interest is not required to be paid even if i mean there is a deferment or if the tax liability on such incomes cannot be predicted or estimated now the proposed amendment 
seeks to include the amount of dividend and the memorandum says that representations were received from the shareholders now since the companies do declare dividend and this is a prerogative of the companies whether they declare or do not declare how much would they declare so it it becomes is i mean it, it is almost impossible for a shareholder to estimate that kind of an income and therefore now this entire dividend should be taken to be an income of this nature which cannot be predicted and therefore the dividend but then while excluding while excluding this dividend from the scope of section 234c a further exclusion has been made out of this dividend that this exclusion would not apply to the deemed dividend under section 2 clause 22 is small e now i have not been able to fathom as to how this amount of deemed dividend i mean could be predicted by a person say in the month of september when the first or second installment advance tax when i mean what is deemed dividend that any shareholder holding more than 10% share holding equity share holding in a closely held company when happens to receive a loan or advance from such closely held company which has got the accumulated profits on the day when he receives the loan or advance then to the extent of loan or advance to the extent of the accumulated profits if they are available as on that date will be deemed to be the income by way of dividend i mean this is the deeming fiction though i am not on this aspect now whether there is any rationale for keeping such kind of deeming fictions under the statute but then be that as it may this is the law but then you kindly imagine that a shareholder say for say holding 11% share holding in a closely held company now raises a loan or advance from that closely held company say in the month of january i'll take the january static month takes loan raises the loan in the month of january now how he could have anticipated either on 15th of june 15th of september or 15th of december i mean those advance tax dates i mean which already had expired that he would he would raise or he would receive a loan or deposit from this closely held company and that closely held company would have accumulated profits as on this date when he happens to receive the loan or advance and therefore now you say that advance tax in relation to even this kind of deem dividend i mean you could have estimated you ought to have estimated and therefore if there is a deferment of such kind of the payment of advance tax and then we will charge interest now according to me there was no justification whatsoever to treat the deemed dividend uh, differently for this purpose at least uh, from the dividend itself and therefore i mean this proposed amendment to that extent i would say i mean uh, is not uh, removing the hardship uh, or uh, yes of course i would say it's not removing the hardship for the tax payers in certain situations then there are proposed amendment to section 1023c 3iad and 3iae as all of us know the section 10 prescribes a certain incomes received by the persons in receipt of such income as exempt income and clause 23c sub clause 3i ad and 3i ae now it says that income from the educational institution or university or medical institutions hospital received by a person now is exempt would be exempt provided these educational institutions exist solely for educational purpose and medical institutions and hospitals exist solely for philanthropic purposes but then there was one condition and the condition was that the annual receipts of such institutions i mean should not exceed the limit as prescribed and the limit prescription was there under rule 2 bc so the board assumed this power under section 295 read with section 1023c 3i ad to prescribe the limit and the limit as per rule 2 bc as made out by the board was rupees 1 crore now the proposed amendment says rather the memorandum uh, relating to the proposed amendment says that lots of representations have been received now which call for an upward revision of this limit as this limit of rupees 1 crore being the annual receipts have remained static and stagnant for a number of years 
and therefore the government sees that it is a fit case where I mean this limit I mean is revised upwardly and therefore the proposed amendment seeks to raise this limit of 1 crore to 5 crores of rupees. Now so far so good I mean there is nothing and in fact uh, I mean there was a long pending demand I mean asking for the upward revision of this limit it's all right but then instead of this kind of limit having been or to be prescribed under the rule now this limit of 5 crores is sought to be built into the scheme of the act so what would happen in future that in case i mean the future demands again an upward revision from 5 crores i mean say to 10 crores of rupees then every time i mean that that upward revision would call for the amendment in the act now had this kind of a power to revise that upward i mean this limit as as was there in rule 2 bc now if had been retained in the in the rule itself then probably i mean there would not have been any necessity i mean for bringing out amendments in future but there is one more amendment i mean which is very crucial and important is to nullify the important impact of the decision of the karnataka high court in children's education society 358 itr 373 now the decision was to this effect and kindly see that decision was reported in 358 itr now we are somewhere near to 440 or 45 itr and in one year there are six volumes of itr now you can very well imagine from 358 to 440 itr i mean how many years journey i mean we have covered much water has flown in ganges since then and now the government wakes up by bringing this proposed amendment to nullify the important impact of this decision of Karnataka High Court. So now before I come to that, let us uh, let us understand as to what was the decision of the Karnataka High Court. The decision of Karnataka High Court was this: that the limit of rupees one crore, as given in Rule Two B C, now ought to be seen with reference to each institution. So if a charitable trust or society is running, say, three educational institutions and two medical institutions, then if the receipt annual receipt of each institution was rupees one crore or less then the income from such educational institutions and medical institutions i mean could be claimed as exempt and provided other conditions of those other conditions given in those sections stand satisfied that they should exist solely for educational purpose or for philanthropic purposes but now the proposed amendment now seeks to say that this limit of five crore receipts i mean would have to be seen on aggregate basis in reference to the receipts of all institutions put together i mean being run by that person or being run by that trust or society if i am permitted to put like this so i mean the example which i gave the aggregate receipts of all the three educational institutions and two medical institutions being run by a particular trust or society now will have to be aggregated and then see whether the limit of five crores is crossed or not if the limit i mean is not crossed i mean beyond five crores then the entire income of all these institutions i mean can be availed of by such person as an exempt otherwise so i mean this is an important amendment which is proposed now Along with this, now I would deal with the charitable trusts and institutions because the charitable trusts and institutions uh, now have received a, a very important, though somebody may say the undue uh, attention. I mean, from the Finance Bill 2021, there are three or four important proposed amendments, and I think uh, that we all must deal with it, and we will. So the corpus donations. Now we have got section 111D and we have got explanation under section 1023C third proviso, which says that voluntary contributions now received by a trust with a specific direction that they shall form part of the corpus now will not be included in income. So far, so good. But then when it comes to the application of 85 percent then the application out of this corpus also used to be counted for the purpose of determining the 85 percent applications therefore there are two important proposed amendments in this regard the first is the anxiety of the government to ensure that the corpus remains intact that corpus is required to be kept in one or more forms 
or modes of investment as prescribed under section 11 sub section 5 and that too is specifically so the corpus donations received by the charitable trust and institutions are required to be kept specifically and uh, since the tracking of such corpus donations is required for several purposes i mean some of which i'll come a little later therefore it would be required to keep a separate account for the corpus donations but then what would happen in respect of the corpus donations having been received in the earlier years i mean the proposed amendment doesn't address that but so far as the new corpus donations now let us take it in case this proposed amendment is culminated into the act that all charitable trust and institutions will have to maintain a separate account and that corpus donations receipt will have to be kept in one or more form or modes of investment as prescribed under section 11.5. The second is that the application out of such corpus donation, if at all is made, and it will not be counted for the purpose of determining 85% of the income applied under section 11.1a. And this amount which is applied out of corpus donations will be considered as application only when kindly do mind it the expression which i'm using only when you happen to redeposit it in the in one or more forms or modes of investment as prescribed under section 11.5 during the year out of the current year's income this is very important so to the extent of the amount redeposit to the extent of the amount reinvested in one or more forms or modes of investment as prescribed under section 11.5 out of the current year's income alone now to that extent the application out of the corpus donations alone will be treated as application for the purpose of computing 85 percent so i mean this is a very important proposed amendment which has to be and which needs to be taken care of the second proposed amendment is relating to the borrowings and loans raised by the charitable trust and institutions because when these charitable trust and institutions used to raise loan and borrowing and then after raising the loan and borrowings i mean such loans or borrowings used to be applied then that application used to be considered to be a part of 85 percent and when later on if that loan or borrowing used to be repaid then also that repayment amount used to be considered as an application so it was it was coming as a i mean taking advantage in a double in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a manner i mean which amounted to double alliance and therefore in order to give quietus i mean to this kind of practice the proposed amendment is there and what is the proposed amendment the proposed amendment is that any application uh, out of the loan uh, of borrowing by a charitable trust and institution will not be considered will not be considered as application for the purpose of determining 85 percent this is very important Will not be considered as an application but any repayment out of this loan or borrowing any repayment of any loan or borrowing out of your current year's income alone will be treated as application and that too and kindly mind it out of the current year's income i mean that means that you cannot make a fresh borrowing and then repay it or i mean you have raised the corpus donations and then you repay the loan or uh, and i mean in that case i mean the repayment will not be treated as application so in earlier instance of the corpus donation that redeposit and reinvestment should be out of your current year's income and similarly in case of the repayment of the loan or borrowing that repayment of the loan or borrowing should be out of your current year's income and uh, therefore i mean these aspects need to be taken care of and the third proposed amendment is an attempt and uh, i would say the successful attempt on the part of the legislature to nullify the decision of the supreme court in the case of uh, subro's educational society i mean that decision rendered by supreme court not very long ago i mean settled that controversy ostensibly i mean for once and all but then and mindful that the legislature i mean in its superior power or if not superior power under the legislature and because of the sovereign function i mean can bring a bring an amendment and the amendment has been brought and that amendment is to this effect that if a charitable trust and institution has made an excessive application of its income and therefore the deficit 
now could be claimed as application in the succeeding years so the set off of the deficit in future years now which was the mandate of the decision of supreme court in the case of subrose educational society now that is proposed to be undone i mean by clearly providing the such kind of a set off is not permissible so this is again a proposed amendment now uh, i mean which uh, uh, is uh, being brought now one uh, thing which has been made out in the proposed amendment is that the time limit for filing the belated return and if the return having been filed then can be revised uh, up to a particular time limit that is proposed to be contracted by 3 months so as all of us know that under section 1394 under section 1395 there are the provisions which enable a taxpayer to file a return belatedly if he has not filed the return or if he has filed the return then he can revise the return provided that he discovers some error omission or wrong statement in his return and the time limit which used to be once upon a time as one year from the end of the assessment year now it was already done that it that it can be done within the assessment year before the close of the assessment year itself so the 31st march of the assessment year i mean used to be the time limit for making a uh, revision of the return or for filing the belated return now the memorandum says that because of the improved processes due to the advancement in technological uh, feats which the department uh, i mean uh, thumbs his chest and therefore the memorandum says that this time limit for filing belated return and filing uh, the revised return now should be a period lesser than 31st march and it should be lesser by 3 months meaning thereby that 31st december is the last date by which uh, a return can be revised or a belated return can be filed now imagine it uh, imagine a person whose books of accounts have been audited and last date for him was 31st of october similarly in case of those ssc's i mean who undertake uh, the transfer pricing a uh, study for them that last date for filing the return is 30th of november now for such kind of ssc's like in the first instance i mean two months time will be given and in the second instance only one month time is given i do not know and because it has been my experience and so must be yours and so must be yours that if there is an error omission or wrong statement now suppose which has crept in one years return i mean most of the times it is found i mean not so early it is found on some occasion at a later stage and therefore to contract this time period by 3 months and thereby making 31st december as the last date by which you can file uh, a return belatedly or file the revised return i mean by this date is something i mean which cannot be said to be at least removing the hardships but conversely and contrarily i would say increasing the hardship of the taxpayers uh then one rationalization i mean is proposed uh, by making a clarifications that to in a very circuitous manner regarding the employees contributions of the provident fund in the esi now i can claim uh, that in respect of the esi and pf i mean two i mean decisions go to my credit now uh, supreme court decisions are allom extrusions in 390 itr i had the privilege of arguing the decision before my lord justice as such kapadia as it then was uh, but then that was in case dominantly that was in case of a of an employer's contributions though i remember the case which i represented i mean because it was a batch matter and one of the case which i represented was with the dtdc courier and in my case i vividly remember it was not only the employer's contribution or employee's contribution somehow that decision i mean did not deal specifically on the employee's contributions and therefore that decision is taken as an authority only in relation to the employer's contribution be that as it may the other decision i mean to which i was the party before the delhi high court and authored by my lord justice sikri as he then was in delhi high court was the case of amil limited i mean 321 itr at page 508 and kindly see 321 itr and we are in the age of 440 itr six itrs in a year now you can very well imagine i mean the number of years which have passed in between and now the government has tried to clarify after the expiry of so many years 
so the decision was on employees contributions and the lordships in para 8 clearly mentioned that the due date in respect of employees contributions i mean would be taken to be the due date of filing of return as is applicable in case of employees contributions and i tell you the arguments i mean which were developed by me and which ultimately persisted with the lordship i mean was this uh, that uh, first of all real income the employees contributions i mean you are treating it as income under section 2 clause 24 i mean there is no trace of income you are helping the welfare state to discharge its welfare function now you are helping the government to discharge its welfare functions by collecting the contributions of the employees of their provident fund and esi and then giving giving it to the government you are acting as a conduit and then the income tax act which defines as to what is the income seeks to treat even these contributions which you deduct from your employee wages and salary as your income i mean this is the height of this is the height that's something which i have to pay to the government by collecting it for and on behalf of the government now is being treated as an income anyway but then there is section 3615 which says that these income which we have so treated as your income now will be allowed to as a deduction provided you paid on or before the due date of filing of return now when the original acts parent act of this provident fund and the esi when they condone this action of paying it belatedly by taking some damages and charges then what was so big for the income tax department to act as a super parent i mean that was one of the argument apart from the real income theory and then the purposive interpretation as to what was the purpose to enforce the compliance and and then what is the rationale and justification for not allowing employees contribution as a deduction even if there is a one day's delay like in case of employees contribution now if you don't pay it on or before the due date of filing of return you happen to pay it thereafter then it can be allowed as a deduction in that year but employees contributions I and mean, you have sought to make the provisions in such an absolute and utilitarian manner that in case you happen to jump the 15th of the following month which is the last date for depositing this amount say on 16th then this deduction i mean would be lost and would be lost forever now can there be any semblance of justification i mean for giving such kind of step motherly treatment to the employees contributions and only on this ground that you are acting you are collecting this amount in trust and therefore any delay now is nothing but an unjust enrichment but is this not a case of a larger unjust enrichment on the part of the government to deny the deductions once for all if there is a, even if there is a delay of one day or two days or five days i mean at least i mean some proposed amendment could have been you know on this line that it will be allowed you in the year in which you happen to pay once you jump the gun that is the 15th of the following month so on the one hand i mean you made such bold bald and very grand stand in the memorandum that this unjust enrichment by not paying it on or before the due dates of these acts by the employers must stop yes it must stop but at the same time the state also should not get enriched i mean by creating such kind of an artificial disalliances i mean that is what my take is dispute resolution committee and ah yes on that whether this proposed amendment would apply in respect for the pending matters because now this says the proposed amendment says that this clarification i mean would be applicable from assessment year 2021 and 22 but then the way that clarification has been worded for the removal of doubts it is clarified that it was never intended to be the due date is prescribed under section 43b and therefore the department would definitely argue that by adopting the mischief rule of interpretation that this proposed amendment is clarificatory and even though the parliament seeks to say that it will come into effect from assessment year 21 22 but then it is a curative amendment therefore it should be treated to have come into effect with a with retrospective effect i mean so the litigation is not going to end and the persons who are into litigations like me and you i mean they stand to i mean they would stand me benefited don't i mean i mean don't worry 
but then i am on a i am i mean though i have said it in the lighter side but i am the larger plank on the larger i mean i would say that such kind of an illogical irrational provisions in the first place ought not to stand if at all it is uh, allowed to stand i mean this kind of clarification in my respectful submission is regressive is retrograde i mean cannot be said to be progressive and therefore i mean in many times i have seen the proposals which are there in the finance bill i mean seem to be inconsistent with the overall approach of the government dispute resolution committee dispute resolution committee we have seen dispute, dispute resolution panel and our experience of the dispute resolution panel has not been very soothing and pleasant we have seen dispute resolution panel i mean though being manned by uh, i mean principal commissioners or senior principal commissioners i mean uh, consisting college of three principal commissioners i mean the kind of order the dispute resolution panels had all along been passing and they are known for it I mean, they used to be very cryptic non speaking laconic one liner and therefore i mean whenever i mean such kind of orders used to be appealed before the tribunal the tribunal i mean did not have any option but to remand the matter back to the dispute resolution panel but then that was the story of dispute resolution panel and this bhumika which i made i mean has been made with this that the dispute resolution committee also should not go the same way so the dispute resolution committee as the name suggests that this committee would be constituted by the board and the power is proposed to be taken in this finance bill to create as many as dispute resolution committee now which when approached by the persons who are covered under it or who are who are, who are proposed to be covered under covered under it now would have the power to reduce or waive the penalty and to grant grant immunity from the prosecution but then kindly see now if at all i mean dispute resolution committee in the present proposed form now is going to be of any real and substantive help now it says that it will be applicable only in case of those ssc whose returned income doesn't exceed 50 lakhs rupees okay. number 1 number 2 that the amount of addition of the disallowance of the proposed variation in the assessment order should not be more than 10 lakhs rupees okay. now i mean this much of a small quantum of the disallowance and addition now is going to i mean is 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 going to what kind of substantive purpose that is what my question is now we have got if you forget about 115 bbe i mean which is speaks on 78% tax rate now in most of the cases the tax rate is 30% burden with surcharge i mean comes somewhere 33 or 35% i mean on i mean i mean i mean loosening side i spoke so the tax impact will be 3 and 3 half lakhs of rupees and even if we apply 115 b b e and then also the tax liability i mean somewhere seven and half lakhs of rupee so for such kind of a situation i mean to constitute dispute resolution committee and to highlight i mean this committee in such a way as to what kind of bonanza or the benefits or the concessions are proposed to be doled out to the tax payers is something i mean i think uh, which uh, according to me is nothing but an eye wash is a pretense and uh, therefore and kindly see now this kind of a provision is in the face of already existing a far better section on the statute section 270 aa uh, pankaj may kindly switch off his uh, camera because i don't appreciate somebody sipping the tea and uh, it belittles yes very good so uh Oh, it is it distracts me dispute is uh, yes we have got already section 270 capital a section 270 capital a empowers the assessing officer and as compared to dispute resolution committee i find the assessing officer more powerful because in case application is made within 30 days after the suspended order is passed to the assessing officer seeking the waiver or the reduction in penalty and immunity from prosecution by paying the taxes and the interest within that time and not filing appeal then the assessing officer can grant you and the only condition is that the penalty initiated in the assessment order should not be for misreporting of income as yes, it can be there for the under reporting of income so dispute resolution committee i mean to what extent it will prove an effective or efficacious institution 
is something i mean which is there and then kindly see the riders for them that this assessment should not be as a result of search it should not be as a result of requisition under section 132 capital a it should not be as a result of a survey now, i mean there are, i find i mean lots of so called concessions come i mean so many riders with so many conditionalities so many ifs and buts uh, ifs after ifs and buts after buts sometimes even the ifs after buts and the buts after ifs and therefore i will make the entire i mean proposed amendments or the amendments even if giving a minuscule kind of relief and concession i mean they lose their charm now as i said this finance bill will be known for uh, writing obituary for two important uh, institutions regarding the authority for advance ruling though i mean it may not be i mean concern to many of us but authority for advance ruling now has seen i mean many weathers but then i think this is the weather i mean which has been found rough by the authority for advance ruling and this finance bill proposed amendment we often say that institution is r double a r authority for advance ruling now on the lighter note now i say this r is being consigned to par and now is being replaced by bar board of advance ruling now board of advance ruling i mean will henceforth i mean be manned by uh, officers of not rank of not less than the chief commissioner's rank uh, earlier and the chairman of that authority of advance ruling used to be the supreme court judge retired or the chief justice retired chief justice of high court and that is why probably that institutions may not be under the direct supervision superintendence and control of the cbdt and therefore now from a date to be notified by the central government or that will advance ruling now will stop functioning and the regional reason and rationale which has been given in the finance bill is that a lots of pendencies were there the rulings were not coming in time because of the vacancies i mean the ostensibly which has been put in the memorandum is that the vacancies uh, could not be filled and because of which i mean that institution was not functioning and because of which there was a lot of accumulation fine i mean i mean because i mean most of us they most of us do not deal at that level therefore but then one important thing i mean which has been which is proposed in this authority of advance ruling is that earlier the ruling given by authority of advance ruling was not appealable before the high court yes of course i mean many times the department as well as the a ruling seeker i mean knocked at the door of the high court under writ jurisdiction when there was a breach of the principle of natural justice or when there was a lack of jurisdiction but uh, now it has been or it is proposed to be uh provided specifically that there will be appeal now which can be preferred by either of the parties before high court and that appeal then will have to be preferred preferred within a period of 60 days and uh, now settlement another, another institution which has come as a flag is a settlement commission i mean aar has been given some breathing space but the income tax settlement commission has not even handed out i mean any time whatsoever <laughs> and there and therefore income tax settlement commission now is proposed to be consigned to the dustbin of history lock stock and barrel and all pending applications now will henceforth be transferred to the board interim board that interim board will be manned by the officers of the rank of the chief commissioner and pending applications one 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 option is proposed to be given to the taxpayers whose applications are pending then they can withdraw it within a period of 3 months itat is also proposed to be made faceless but then i have got very strong reservations as to how i mean uh, the effective and efficacious justice for which the tribunal is known by and large i mean can because it is the final fact finding body and before the first appellate authority now uh, if some facts were not found correctly then we had got the satisfaction in solace then we can knock at the door of the income tax appellate tribunal can set the facts right but if the tribunal also goes faceless then i tell you to break the head with the mountains of paper the heaps of paper and paper book is not that easy task and there will be larger instances of miscarriage of justice at that level and when there will be large number of instances of miscarriage of justice then ultimately the burden will shift to the high court the high courts are already under tremendous pressures uh, because of the backlog now if these cases also i mean become or are piled up before the high court the agony of the high court can very well be understood such assessments under section 153a and 153c now hence forth i mean will not be uh, done 
in respect of the search or requisition uh, initiated on or after 1 4 2021 and now the assessments of the search assessment of the requisition and the assessment of the survey now survey has also been included now will be done based upon the new scheme of assessment this is very important new scheme of assessment now in all search cases in all requisitions cases in all survey cases now preceding three years cases will be reopened as a mandatory requirement even if there were something which has been found or like in case of 153a now whether something has been found or not the very fact that there was a search now empower the income tax officer to reopen six years past assessment now in case of survey now taking place on or after 1 4 2021 or search on or after that date instead of six years three years cases now will be reopened under section 147 and now the proposed amendment says that information suggesting that the income has escaped assessment will be deemed i mean this is the height of the deeming picture anyway so uh, there is a wholesale changes which are proposed in the scheme of reassessment under section 147 as all of us know if the assessing officer has reason to believe as per the existing provisions that income charge even to tax has escaped assessment then he can reopen the he may reopen the assessment the reason to believe now was used to be an important reason to believe used to be an important check now that uh, that check now is proposed to be i mean uh, sent to the gallows i mean it is proposed to be sent i mean to the dustbin of history is being consigned in the bay of bengal so reason to believe now would no longer control the action of reopening i mean to be resorted by the assessing officers and then uh, period of three years instead of earlier six years period of three years in case of normal assessment normal assessment means where the evidence suggesting income escaping assessment is not more than 50 lakhs or rupees and the three years is the time limit and if uh, income suggesting or the or income escaping assessment amounts to or is likely to amount to rupees 50 lakhs or more then up to 10 years the cases can be reopened then what i mean there are other technical points also uh prior approval of the specified authority now which used to be there but kindly do mind it i mean since we are chartered accountants many times we may not view certain expressions so closely but i tell you now earlier under section 151 the expresses used to be that these authorities have to be satisfied that it is a fit case for issue of notice now the word satisfied is proposed to be changed by the word approval though we interchangeably use this expression approval with the word satisfaction but then i mean they are poles apart i mean they convey different uh, meaning on the touchstone of law and uh, approval has got the overtones of the administrative approval whereas when the legislature says that a particular authority has to be satisfied then though the satisfaction may be subjective satisfaction but the courts have said that such subjective satisfaction has to be based on objective consideration yes before issuing notice under section 148 the assessing officer would be entitled to make inquiry and then is or may or may not give opportunity hearing to the sse and thereafter he is required to pass an order as to why he believes that this case requires i mean reassessment and uh, this is there then the charitable trust i spoken yes now uh, there are other technical issues but then quickly i will take i mean those things i mean which are impacting regarding tds on purchase of goods now this is uh, i mean something i am proposed amendment I and mean, which will go a long way i mean impacting all of us and this kind of an attempt was sought to be made even last year's finance bill but after receiving lots of representation i mean that proposal was dropped at that stage now again it has resurfaced in finance bill 2021 now it says that if you are a buyer and who is the buyer who is buying the goods whose turnover gross receipts or sales in the preceding year i mean i mean has crossed a limit of 10 crores of rupees is the buyer and while making purchases of more than rupees 50 lakhs then he is required to deduct tax at the rate of 0.1 percent on a sum in excess of rupees 50 lakhs at the time of credit or payment whichever is earlier but then it says that if there is any other section under which the tax is required to be deducted on this amount then this section this is section 194q and yesterday when i was speaking in nirc now i, I use that expression 194q or 194q i mean 
I mean that phonetic expressions which is there. Uh, so it says that if there are any other provisions under which the TDS is to be directed, then you need not to go in for the deduction under section 194Q. Similarly, if the tax is to be collected on this amount, then also, I mean, this TDS, I mean, provision will not come into existence for that kind of a situation. But then 206C1H, that the seller will collect 0.1% or whatever percentage which is there in the, in the section. I mean, that he will collect, seller will collect. Therefore, there will be instance that the buyer will collect, buyer, buyer will deduct, and then the seller will collect. So, I mean, this is very uh, important proposed amendment which is there. Then TTS and TCS on non-filers. I mean, we have seen that there is an increased rate of TTS and TCS in case the person out of whose income the amount is deducted or collected doesn't have the permanent account number. We have got section 206AA and section 206CC. Now, one more section in both TDS and T TCS is proposed to be inserted. Now, according to which, if the person, I mean, out of his income, either the TDS is being made or the TCS is made, is a non-filer of return. Now, who is non-filer? That who has not filed his return in the preceding two years and the due date for filing of return on 139.1 has expired. And then the amount of TDS and TCS in respect of that person in both the years, I mean, is in excess of 50,000 in each of those two years. So such persons, if they are non-filers, then there are increased tax rates and uh, those tax rates are proposed in the sections only. So I think now it's quarter to two. If there are questions though, I mean, there are several, it cannot be covered within such short time because there are 79 proposed amendments in the finance bill 2020-21. But I have picked some of them, then Charitra is there. Now who can touch upon the other aspects? But since I have come to Vishakapatnam to deliver my lecture in the regional conference, and the people are waiting for me downstairs, I have come back in my hotel room. So I think if, that, if there are questions, then I will take them. And then, uh, because, uh, I mean, my way of uh, expressing these provisions is not merely to tell the law, but then, I mean, what are the macro aspects, I mean, which preceded the introduction and which, and therefore that is why, I mean, not many chartered accountants, I have found my friends, I mean, who are more interested in knowing what is the bare provision of law, I mean, may not follow, I mean, may not be attending my, web, may, may, my seminar, but then I try to raise the bar of discussion at a different level and plank. So with this, I'll give quite a to my this deliberations. I thank each one of you for having lent your patient ears. If there are questions, then I will be pleased. I will be more than pleased to, I mean, take them up. Okay, Charitra, Pankaj. All right, Charitra, unmute yourself, Charitra. Sir. Yes. If there are questions, can let me know. Okay, yeah. now the forum is open. Uh, any pertinent question relating to that, you can please ask any member and they can raise your hand and then Pankaj will allow them to speak. In the middle, sir, a goodwill wala thoda jo provision hai, wo bhi important hai, sir. I mean, they, they, I mean, they say that goodwill is bound to increase always. Or if not increase, it will not depreciate. And even if it depreciate, it will not allow you the depreciation. That is the sum and substance. Now, now they say that in case you have, even if you have acquired goodwill by paying some cost, then also will not allow you depreciation. Now, whether the depreciation should be made applicable or not, the sovereign government by virtue of its sovereign power has thought it like this, not to grant depreciation in relation to the goodwill. But then as I said, on a couple of occasions in the past, that is Smith's decision of Supreme Court came and was reported in 348 ITR. We are somewhere in 440, we are somewhere near to 445 ITR. The government took these many years, I mean, to unsettle the settled position and then again creating that kind of a vacuum. So, I mean, this is going to affect at least in the acquisitions, in the reorganizations, in the reconstruction, restructuring. I mean, when the excess payment is made, of course, that excess payment is made for the purpose of acquiring certain un, uh, intangible valuable rights, including goodwill. So, I mean, but then you would not allow depreciation. I mean, certain rules would be formed 
I mean, to take care of such situation where the goodwill having been part of the block of assets, and now the block of assets, I mean, would cease to exist. Then what would happen? I mean, all those kind of rules or some guidelines will come from the board, and uh, it is in the womb of time. But we can take it as some in substance that henceforth, now goodwill, and I will not be the subject matter of depreciation. This time, sir, they also taken care that everywhere they have cautiously written goodwill of the business or the profession. Uh, they, I, I was finding they have not left it anywhere. Everywhere it is, is good business. And, and you kindly see, the legislature has become, I mean, very over indulgent, over cautious, highly proactive, and many provisions would smack of the highest level of distrust. between the government and the taxpayer now one one example i would give very quickly you have raised very good question now you read the definition of residential unit now which is proposed to be inserted by one explanation to section 43 ca i mean kindly go back when you go back to your home kindly see explanation to section 43 ca i mean the way it has been drafted i mean that smacks of the highest degree of distrust i mean between the government and the taxpayer and i am not saying the government is unjustified because many of us in the business i mean they tend to take advantage by finding out some loopholes from here and there and that is why so i mean what comes first i mean whether the egg or whether the chick i mean that question has always bothered us so uh, yes sir regarding 43 ca yes uh, they have made amendment in 43 ca Yes, but uh, that twenty percent extension fifty C K case me to available nahi hai. Because because the object, I mean the, the the memorandum says that in order to give boost to the real estate sector number one, and to enable the real estate developers to liquidate their stock holding or the piled up stock holding, so they have they they have proposed to make insertions to section forty three C because that is applicable in case of the real estate developer. so okay. isliye 50c they have they have not touched they have got, but then that kind of a concession is no concession i mean those residential units out of the real estate stock why only why not commercial i mean these are very contrived kind of uh, uh, manner in which the concession the super concession uh, they they also create had creating anomalous situation under section 56 also Ah. Because now 43 CA, if I am buying from a real estate developer, yes. I am entitled to 20% lesser valuation. Yes, yes. But if I am buying from a third party, no, uh, who no, is not a real estate developer, no, then no, I no. get only 10%. No, Charitra. Even if you are buying from real estate developer, but it is not by way of the first allotment, then also you are not entitled. So yes. I mean, as I said at some point of time during my discussion, that there are so many ifs. so many buts ifs after ifs buts after but many times in the buts after ifs and ifs after but i mean conditionality like in case of the senior citizen i mean i i sometimes i i tend to feel as if i must hang my head in shame here you want to you want to give certain concession want to show a sensitivity but then the manner that sensitivity comes to be expressed i mean i mean this is too much now probably i think it will not be i mean fear on my part to say something else this child is very cute uh, yes anything else or should i log off uh, pankaj my friend uh, mukesh mota sir kahan hai wo lagta hai chale gaye hain sir vaccine lagwa rahe hain vaccine lagwa rahe hain aapne bahut busy schedule ke baad bhi time nikala ha i think bijinder ji asking some question sir pardon i think bijinder ji asking some question ओके ओके बिजेंद्र जी आदेश होता है सर मेरा छोटा सा क्वेश्चन था जैसे जो लोग मतलब इसमें फॉल करते हैं लाइक जो दस करोड़ की टर्न ओवर से कम में है दस करोड़ तक टर्न ओवर में है और पांच परसेंट से कम कैश में ट्रांजेक्ट कर रहे हैं वॉलेंटरली अपना चाह रहे हैं
कोविड और वैक्सीन दोनों में से किसी ने कोई फायदा नहीं उठाया दोनों को हुआ दोनों हॉस्पिटल में भर्ती हुए एक ही कमरे में रहे सर एक बार बताए आज जिस उम्र में हमारे बच्चे हैं उस उम्र से पहले भी हम सब लोग मिले हुए हैं ना जुड़े हुए हैं यस 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 मैं अभी कह रहा था मुकेश जी आप नहीं थे जब पंकज थे क्योंकि विजेंद्र जी बोले राकेश जी आप पंकज को धन्यवाद दे रहे थे धन्यवाद के पात्र तो मुकेश मोहता जी ज्यादा है मुकेश मोहता जी का ऑडियंस होता है थैंक यू सर थैंक यू बट हाँ विजेंद्र तुम कुछ पूछ रहे हो ये जरूर लगता है अगर आपका समय मिले तो डेफिनेटली एक बड़ी इम्पोर्टेंट चीज है और जितने अच्छे तरह से आप कॉन्सेप्ट क्लियर कर पाते हैं क्योंकि मेरे लिए तो खैर बिल्कुल ही अब ये सॉर्ट ऑफ फॉरेन सब्जेक्ट बन गया है ठीक Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Okay, see, okay, this is so nice of you. You have given me this opportunity, and this boy Pankaj is very sweet and dear. And uh, sir, 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 मुकेश जी कैन आई लॉग ऑफ यस सर थैंक यू सर एक मिनट वंडरफुल इवेंट सर सर बस सर एक फॉर्मल धन्यवाद दे दे सर आपका अरे मैं तो अपने घर में हूँ सर फिर भी सर बच्चे हैं हम आपके एटलीस्ट लाइक जब भी सर आपको सुनता हूँ और मैं सभी लोगों को कहता हूँ राकेश जी को सुनता तो डिस्टर्बेंसेज दूर रखो You have to listen each and every word. अगर कुछ भी मिस करो तो बड़ा आपको अपना ही लॉस होगा वेरी वेरी गुड डेलीवरेशन सर नहीं कल चरित्र मुझे मुझे राजकुमार जी ने बहुत बड़ा कॉम्प्लीमेंट दिया राजकुमार जी के कॉम्प्लीमेंट को तो आई टेक इट ऑन हार्ट ही सेट की राकेश आई मीन टू लिसन यू इज ए म्यूजिक टू दर्स आई मीन कमिंग फ्रॉम ए पर्सन ऑफ इज टेचर आई मीन आई आई बाउ डाउन विद अटमोस्ट एंड एक्सेप्ट इज अटमोस्ट ह्यूमिलिटी Yes, yes, yes. Of course, and you cannot afford to miss a single note. It's a very nice uh, music. <laughs> like, uh, it's a bit of one symphony, actually. <laughs> so, thank you, sir. Thank you for. Uh, thank you, thank you, Charit. I am honored. I am honored, Mukesh ji. I am honored, Pankaj Charitra, Vijendra ji. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. 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 Thank you, has left us uh, for the seminar now we have got uh, another speaker with us nitin goyal ji uh, nitin ji are you there yes sir yes sir yes sir so nitin ji i welcome you on the seminar and uh, of course pankaj has read out your brief uh, uh, earlier also but uh, yes. i have come to know that uh, uh, 
you are you are having a experience of 17 years in the indirect taxes and in big fours and right now you are in serving as a director in a very big four company dealing with the global trade matters and uh, your uh, indirect tax matters and uh, you have got multiple degrees and all those blah blah so uh, the no need to after 17 years uh, in a big four union you don't need too much uh, to say about your credentials and uh, but uh, oh, another part is that sir uh, i may like to know that all our audience and nitin is not any like uh, oh, he is like one of us is like our brother actually so uh, is like one of us only so and uh, his deliberation is going to be more uh, beneficial for all of us doing the gst practice or uh, having uh, want to know the gk of the gst in our routine practice those who not may not be gst expert even they also required to know something i am at a income tax uh, you know guy but uh, i also need to know sometimes some sort of uh, gst so his deliberation are going to be directed towards that and in this particular the members will be more interested about nitin ji knowing that what about this gst audit because for a normal practitioner it has become a sort of bread and butter abhi tak kya hota tha ki sirf tax audit ke paise milte the kuch bhi aap kaam karo usme included hote the ab jab ye gst audit aaya to pehli baar ek aisa change aaya jiske hame extra paise milne lage ek tax Uh, practicing chartered accountant ko over and about tax 